question. Uh, welcome to Humanities Montana's happy hour. Um, we are having so much fun doing these and we are incredibly excited to have Mary Jane Bradbury lead us through a, um, a lecture and a conversation um, um, called And Yet She Persisted. So with that, Mary Jane, I'm just gonna let, turn this over to you and let you take it from here. All right, well, thank you very much. And Randy, look at you, you're wearing your suffrage sash. Good job. The uh, colors of the, the gold and the white and the purple were colors that the suffragists chose for their sashes and their banners. And <sighs> when I decided to put this program together, and yet she persisted um, a year ago, 2020 was the, the uh, 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, a big opportunity to celebrate women achieving the right to vote as an amendment to the Constitution. And I knew that 2020 is an election year. We've got a lot, we had a lot on our minds in terms of approaching this new year. Uh, and then everything has changed now. So I still would like to, uh, to um, take you through this content about the uh, journey to achieving the 19th Amendment as a historical chronology but also take some side trips and look at some of the other layers that go into change, times of change. How do people uh, negotiate times when there's uncertainty? And all of those for different reasons were part of the suffrage um, journey. So we'll look at all that, have a chance to, to visit a little bit. Before we start, I wanted to do a couple of things. Suffrage, as we're using the word means to allow political freedom. That's what they wanted us, to be um, seen as citizens. Uh, the franchise is a right or a privilege, and in this case, it's a synonym for the vote. And uh, equality, as we're using it, is political equality. Women wanted to be seen as equal participators in the culture and the, the political arena. A reminder, too, that during the time of this story, Print is the only medium. There's no mass communication of any kind except for print. So newspapers, magazines, uh, handbills, uh, political cartoons, those were the ways that people communicated. And of course, the people writing those articles and those stories, their uh, opinions went into all this. So it was just print that people were influenced by during the suffrage fight. All right, so the parameters of the Constitution uh, don't say that women can't vote, but it doesn't say that they can. There's no reference to gender in the original Constitution at all. And because women's rights were, were um, uncertain and vulnerable, most states were given, or all states were given the opportunity to decide who could vote, and every state excluded women. So when the women decided that they were going to fight for this designation of citizenship, they were truly revolutionaries. They were going against the status quo that had been in place for generations, for, for many, many years. And that took a lot of courage. That took a lot of looking outward and saying, hey, there's something wrong here, we need to fix it. And then dedicating their lives in many cases to achieving this change. All right, so how many people have heard of Seneca Falls, New York, the first women's rights convention? Uh, I was actually born and raised in Seneca Falls, but that's another story. Nobody cared about women's uh, rights or history when I was growing up. Um, Seneca Falls might have been the first um, organized uh, meeting around specifically women's suffrage but it had been going on for a long time. Previous to that, um, let me pull up. Abigail Adams, when her husband John was helping to write the Constitution, said to him, don't forget the ladies. They will feel not at all bound by laws in which they have no representation. Mary Wollstonecraft, wrote the first feminist writing that was published. And she wrote in the Vindication on the Rights of Women that if you want women to be better mothers and better partners and better companions, it would be great if they could get a good education. 
So she advocated for more opportunities in education for women. At the beginning of the 19th century, so the early 1800s, the suffragists combined with the abolitionists and Sarah and Angelina Grimke were two staunch abolitionists that were very outspoken, actually born and raised on a slave owning farm in South Carolina, but they were against slavery. And Angelina Grimke was the first woman to speak to a legislative body. And she asked the Massachusetts legislature if they wouldn't please go to Washington, the District of Columbia, and ask the, the federal government to abolish slavery there, because that might filter down to the rest of the states. Uh, they didn't take her up on her suggestion, but it was the first time that a woman spoke to a body like that. It was just not the custom or acceptable for women to speak in public. Lucy Stone was an abolitionist speaker who was a tremendously compelling speaker and was uh, inspired by Angelina. And she said, I will speak and uh, brave ridicule and persecution for the sake of the good that will come. In 1840, there was a anti-slavery uh, convention in London. Lucretia Mott was one of the delegates that the United States sent, and they wouldn't seat women in London. She was incensed by this. The women had to sit off to the side. They couldn't participate. But she met a young woman there who was also very upset by it. And they, they vowed that when they got back to the United States, they would put together some sort of a, of a meeting that would address um, women's rights in the United States. Eight years later in 1848, she got together with that young woman again. That young woman was Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And they put together the Seneca Falls Convention. And that word spread. The newspapers, magazines talked about these women in Seneca Falls. And very shortly thereafter, regional conventions started to happen. And people were really caught up in it. In 1851, Elizabeth Cady Stanton met Susan B. Anthony. And together they formed one of the most formidable associations in the history of social and political reform. Susan B. Anthony was a Quaker teacher. She was not married. She had the freedom to travel. Elizabeth Cady Stanton had a big family. She wasn't able to travel with all her children, but she was a tremendous writer. So between the two of them, Anthony doing the traveling and the speaking, and Stanton doing the writing, they, they were able to to really spearhead and get off the ground this fight for women's suffrage. So how many people here have heard the, the uh, saying, well-behaved women rarely make history? Well-behaved women rarely make history. So does that mean that badly behaved women do make history? Good girls and bad girls, what does it mean exactly? You know, Mae West, once said that it pays to be good, but it doesn't pay a lot. So what does that mean? What was expected of women? What was believed about women? And more importantly, what did they believe about themselves that restricted them from making any sorts of advancements? The well-behaved woman is defined in 1852 Godey's Ladies Book as courteous, cheerful, polite, pious, industrious and good-natured, moral and benevolent, avoids gossip and fault-finding, grumbling and public displays of family quarrels. She's not stubborn or self-centered, has good table manners, and shows respect for parents. With this, she should be able to obtain her culturally determined goal of a good marriage and motherhood. Biology is destiny. Furthermore, a woman had no place in public life because a woman's inferior physical capabilities were confirmed by the lack of a robust constitution. But how robust would anybody be if they were trussed up in one of these courses. If women indulge in exceptional exertion, they are prone to nervous irritability and neurasthenic disease, delicate, high-strung, subject to fits of anxiety, or even 
hysteria. Women need to avoid anxiety producing enervating situations, intense mental excitement, anger, grief, joy, pursuing an academic education. All of this brings further injury to the health. Women are too frail to be citizens and their efforts acted out rashly and foolishly make them ultimately unfit for public life because of perilous injury brought on by the irritations of the outside world. Yeah. Native women, slave women, working class women, all were proof that women were capable of physical health and activity but they weren't considered in this equation. No matter what their um, accident of birth might have been, everyone aspires to this lofty cult of true womanhood. And that is where women were stuck. And uh, here's a freedom you probably hadn't heard about. Women's leg freedom. The Chicago Tribune wrote an editorial about this very thing that um, Unless women are allowed ankles, there's no hope for their brains. For some unscrutable reason, women have been denied leg freedom and no one can possibly dispute the fact that they deserve it. For some reason, the liberty has been denied them. So let's look at some of the restrictions that clothing placed on women. All right. The 1860s, you can see that this corset was causing her form to be such. Big hoop skirts. One of the reasons that these hoop skirts were so essential is because it was basically believed that women didn't have anatomy below the waist. And they certainly didn't have legs, limbs if you must, but um, that was just not proper to be thought of as part of a woman's function. So that style of, of clothing was, um, accentuated the fact that that's what restriction was on women. The 1870s, the hoops went away, but a lot of draperies, a lot of um, extra fabric. The 1880s, a lot of the fabric goes away, but the bustle, the ex accentuating the backside of a person is quite um, in evidence. And by the 1890s, all the extra underpinnings, the cages and the crinolines and such are gone. And a new form is um, in evidence, an S shape, a monobosom, and then the bottom of her body uh, formed to the back. And what was causing this was the corset. Here's the 1860s corset, lovely hourglass figure. And by the 1890s, see how this corset is causing her to have a, an S shaped figure. And here is the back of that. Um, what's going on inside her body, I wonder? Well, a woman has anatomy, and when you wear a corset for decades, this is what was happening. Their insides had to go somewhere, and so they went away from where they should have been. Women in the 1870s, they have a nice profile. These women are on their way out to shoot, but still they're being quite conforming to fashion of the day. In the 1890s, the profile is, is a lot more streamlined. Of course, it's still in evidence for the shape. And then by the 1910s, clothing starts to loosen up a little bit, but by the 1910s, women were achieving a lot more freedoms in society and with their other rights. So that was a natural evolution. So in dress reform, we've got Amelia Bloomer. She was in Seneca Falls wearing a bloomer costume, and she had a trouser underneath a skirt with no hoops. My gosh, it was practical, it was comfortable, and it was scandalous in the extreme. Women couldn't really take to wearing these clothes at that time in public because people laughed at them. People thought they were ridiculous. So they wore clothes like this at home, but in public they conformed to what was expected. And here's one of my favorites, Mary Walker. Oh my gosh, Mary Walker was a um, physician. She got her, her um, physician's degree and she wanted to serve as 
a surgeon during the Civil War, it literally took an act of Congress to be allowed to wear trousers so that she could work on the battlefield. And when the war was over, she just preferred those kinds of clothes and so she kept wearing them. She was arrested once for impersonating a man. Cross-dressing was an illegal act in those days. And when she demanded her day in court, this is what she said. She said, I reserve the right to dress as I please in a free America on whose tented fields I serve in the cause of that freedom. The judge told the police to never bother her again. And over the years, Mary Walker just added more and more practical clothing to what she um, showed up in public. She actually met Jeanette Rankin in 1917 when Jeanette first went to, to Washington. And Jeanette, of course, was an impeccable dresser, always just very well turned out. She asked, Dr. Walker one time, Dr. Walker, why do you wear men's clothes? Dr. Walker said, Jeanette, I don't wear men's clothes. I wear my own. So women were battling on a number of fronts. They wanted to change the rules. They wanted to change the laws so that they could participate in society. They also had to change people's minds. That was the status quo of the time to change people's minds about what women were capable of. But before they could do that, they had to change their own minds about what they were capable of and how they should show up. And that takes a lot of courage. Many of us have been in places where we needed to institute change or accept change, and it took an internal process as well as an external one in order to do that. So what I would like to do right now is take a quick minute. I hope perhaps you have access to a um, piece of paper and a pencil. I should have mentioned that early. Take a minute and write down why you think we as human beings make the choices we do about what we wear and how we show up. If there's any gentleman in this, I see Scott is here, uh, please also note that men observe women and the choices they make and why they wear what they wear. Just take a minute and look at an example in your life or someone else's and then we'll break into groups. We have a big group here. I would love for you to take a couple minutes then and share those with each other. And through the magic of technology, we can do that. All right, so we did you have some fun with that? Um, we had a little couple of little throwbacks in our group about reminiscing about the things we wore. Maybe age and economics are part of it as well. Um, so we're up to the Civil War in terms of women suffrage activities, a women suffragist and the abolitionists uh, had always worked together. But when the war came, the women put their, um, their interests aside and they said, we will fight for the abolition of slavery. And when it's over, you know, maybe we'll all end up with what we want. When the war ended, three amendments set the stage for what we are navigating now in our culture. The first one uh, um, abolished slavery, and that was good. Then you've got several million people who were enslaved with no real clear plan as to what, how they would function in a democratic biracial society. So they had to be an amendment that defined that. And the next amendment defined citizenship and the protections of it and used for the first time in our constitution, the word male. So now males are citizens, but women are left out. And then the next amendment gave black men the right to vote. It gave black citizens the right to vote. And since a citizen is a man, well, the women were left out completely. And this, oh, this angered Stanton and Anthony to the point where they said, all right, fine, we are gonna work for this amendment, but we're gonna do it 
excluding black women. Then Lucy Stone said, well, wait a minute, at least that's something. We got some rights for some people. Let's just keep working state by state. So there was this period of a couple decades where not a whole lot happened, except there were two distinct suffrage activities going on. A lot of things were happening in the, the history of the country, though, at that time. So by the 1890s, things got a little bit um, to the point where that they kind of came back together. So in the 1890s, we're ready to start pushing forward and a lot of things had changed. All right. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were getting older. And so, uh, oh, share. So they passed the torch to Carrie Chapman Catt and Dr. Anna Shaw, both of them very strong speakers and very strong, dedicated suffragists, organizers. They were able to bring the two factions of the suffrage activities together again to push. 1896 comes, and by that time, four states in the West had given women the right to vote. So it looked like things were really changing and turning around for women. All of the suffrage activities were segregated. They were not integrated at all, but there was also a movement for black women leaders to rise to the top. Mary Church Terrell and Ida B. Wells were two of the outstanding ones. Ida B. Wells in particular was bringing attention to what Jim Crow laws had done to the South um, and the lynchings that were taking place, the mob violence, the discrimination. So there was not only the, the push for them to vote as women, but also the opportunity to speak up about what was happening to them as Blacks. 1890s, we see what was literally called the new woman. By this time, a lot of the things that the people in Seneca Falls had wanted to get um, into place, uh, property rights, married women being able to own property, more educational opportunities for people, women having custody of their children if need be, women having equal pay and the right to keep it. All of these things were beginning to, to happen without the federal amendment for the right to vote. Um, there was also uh, a club woman movement. Women were forming clubs, not just to advance the political agenda, but clubs around literature and art and science, philanthropic activities, orphanages and hospitals. And so they were really proving that they were good at public life. They were good at being part of the society at large. And they were also making a lot of contributions. So this was working for them. In addition to which, there was an invention that had finally come to a point where women could take advantage of it. And that is the bicycle. Women got onto those bicycles and the whole thing burst open. Women should be getting exercise. Women should be getting exercise. It's good for a woman because it, it um, oh, and I've got this memorized, but I don't at this moment. <laughs> Exercise gives women an energy and an endurance and a dexterity and a presence of mind that cannot be overestimated as a sedative for nervous irritability and relief from hypochondria brought on by a sedentary life. Move it, sister, and you'll feel better. In addition to which, this mobility gave women an independence they hadn't had before. You can jump on your bicycle and ride to the next town if you want, or ride to the next county if you want. This kind of mobility was seen as dangerous uh, because it was going to be the downfall of society. The family would disintegrate. These women out there on their own, uh, making choices. Uh, this wasn't a good thing. People who thought um, differently than others advanced. All right, 1910 was kind of the turning point, but up until that, from 1896 to 1910, not a lot happened. There was a lot of things happening in the 
in the country's history, but not in women's suffrage advancement. Remember I said print was the only medium. So let's look at some of the propaganda that was out there. Hopefully your screens are big enough and you can see these. These are little advertisements, pro and con for women voting. Give women the vote and let mothers protect their children. Which hand is fit for the ballot? The hand that rocks the cradle or the hand that pours the whiskey? And then there's the battle ax woman, by golly. Once I get my liberty, no more wedding bells for me. It's gonna just be the downfall of the American family, of the home. This has been women's role for so long. How could she possibly leave it? You may do the voting, but I'm the boss. Not very flattering. Politically, Theodore Roosevelt was president from 1900 to 1908. We're, well, let the people rule. And if you could see closer, there's all sorts of men's humanity in here. There's the robber baron uh, person, there's the, there's the laborer, there's black men, there's other immigrant type men, there's men who are clearly not very with it mentally. That was a big thing that any man could vote. We are the animals and what are we? And then our founding fathers. Did I save my country for this? And then these very emotional pieces. No vote means no remedy for long hours and short pay. To have a voice in the government meant that you could start to legally go after some of the changes that were essential to raising women's condition. And this one, the New York State was considered the state to watch and whatever they did, the rest of the country would soon follow suit. Repeatedly, women's suffrage was defeated in the state of New York and this is an anti-suffrage um, piece, hugging the delusion. This is never going to happen. It's just not right. And my favorite. Votes for women, yes, you bet. That good time will reach us yet. When men folks know how housework feels, we'll have Campbell's soup at all our meals. This hasn't changed much. And it is happy hour, so we have to end on a happy note when we look at this propaganda. Something needed to happen. So a new infusion of en energy comes in the form of Harriet Stanton Blatch, the daughter of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and Alice Paul. Both of these women had been in England, where the suffragists were much more militant and did things like smash windows and storm parliament. And, they came back to this country and said, we really need to be more visible. We need to do more that's out there. We need to have rallies and parades and, and uh, public gatherings, make a lot of noise so that people know this is really important. Alice Paul went one step further and organized a suffrage parade, March 3rd, 1913, the day before President-elect Woodrow Wilson was to come to Washington and be inaugurated. She knew a lot of people would be in town. This was a perfect opportunity to bring attention to the cause. She organized over 8,000 women in groups of everything from marching bands to, um, to sewing clubs, laboring women, um, women uh, advocating for suffrage and their large clubs men's groups, black women, black men. 500,000 people were in attendance. Alice had asked the police for some extra protection. She knew that this might get out of hand and they refused. So as this parade got closer and closer to the Capitol, the crowds got closer and closer to the participants and the next thing you know, there was a riot. Women were attacked, many were injured. No one was arrested but the chief of police lost his job over this. And a couple of blocks away at the train station, Woodrow Wilson was arriving to nobody there to greet him.
Then something very interesting happened. State of Montana elected Jeanette Rankin to Congress. Montana had given women the right to vote, largely because of Jeanette and the organizing that she had done here in the state um, in 1916. I'm sorry, 1914. She ran for Congress in 1916. The suffragists in New York were dead set against it. Uh, they said, if you fail, you're going to prove that women don't belong in public life or political life, so don't stick your neck out. But Jeanette did, and she won by a considerable number of votes. Off she went to Congress, and here's why Montana wanted her, because she can work directly for the passage of suffrage, because Montana should be the first state with a woman in Congress, because of the women of Montana have the right to be represented and because she can work directly for the for national prohibition. The pandemic came in 1918. Women were, um, were volunteering for the war effort. The war started in Europe in 1914. We voted to join it in 1917, uh, but way before we were officially part of the war effort as a country, Women had gone to Europe to drive ambulances, to work in nursing facilities, to work as doctors. Low at home, on the home front, they worked in munitions plants, they worked in food relief places, refugees coming back to the country, soldiers coming back to the country. They said, this is our way to prove that we are all for the country. Whatever it's doing, we should be citizens and be included as a citizen for what we are doing. In 1917, things were really coming to a head. A number of states had given women the right to vote, but Congress would not entertain a national amendment. So Alice Paul and her uh, group started to picket the White House. This was seen as traitorous. We're at war. We have to be supportive of this country. But when, when President Wilson asked for the Congress to vote for the war, he said, we will fight for what we have always fought for, the right of those who subject themselves to the tyranny of their country without having a voice. Well, those suffragists said 20 million American women don't have a voice in their government and they submit to authority, when are you going to support them? The women were attacked. They were arrested and thrown in jail for the crime of obstructing traffic. They were put into hard labor. They were in abysmal, filthy conditions. If they went on a hunger strike, which they often did, they were force fed. When word of this got out to the press, it created a national um, uprising. People said, you, you know, we have to stop this. So President Wilson finally decided to support suffrage. Um, January of 1918, the 19th Amendment passed in the House of Representatives, but it would be two years and four votes before it would pass in the Senate, and then another nine months to be ratified. And then in August of 19. 1920, the 19th Amendment was added to the Constitution in the same wording that Susan B. Anthony proposed 45 years earlier. So when we look at this story, many of those early suffragists had no idea when it would come to pass. And they soon realized that they wouldn't live to see the passage of the 19th Amendment. There was only one woman who was in Seneca Falls, who was 82 years old in 1920, and uh, she got to vote in the presidential election that year. They were working for something they knew they would never live to see, but they knew that the future could be better if they dedicated themselves to what they believed was right. And when I first put this program together, I thought, well, there's, there's the message. What do we believe in so strongly that we would dedicate ourselves to, whether or not we live to see it come to fruition? Um, I don't 
I don't think we should take that message away, but it, there's more to the message now. There's more to the message um, because we are in a time of great uncertainty. To, to amend the end of the story, we voted to go to war with Europe in 1917, in March, but we didn't have enough airplanes, we didn't have enough soldiers, so it took really a year until we had enough people that we could send to Europe and really be a contributing part to the war effort there. Um, the spring of 1918 is when we were kind of all ramped up to send people, and that's when the pandemic struck, the first wave of the pandemic. Um, it wasn't too bad at that point, but think of all those soldier camps, all those boot camps where tens of thousands of young men were all in one spot and they were getting sick. But it wasn't quite the terrible thing it would become in a few months. So we kind of passed it over. It was an election year. So the suffragists who had just succeeded in getting the House of Representatives to pass the amendment, the Senate wouldn't pass it. The Senate was full of the party that opposed suffrage and always had. So they needed to campaign so that in November at the election they could unbalance what was going on in the Senate and get enough of the party that did support suffrage in there. Summer comes, they're starting to campaign, and then fall, the pandemic came back with a virulence that no one could expect. Everything was shut down, schools were shut, businesses were closed, there could be no public rallies. How are the suffragists gonna, um, gonna succeed at getting their candidates elected in November. They took to a fairly new device, although it was becoming more common, the telephone. They ran campaigns. They did everything they could under the restrictions of the pandemic to get the votes for their candidates, and they succeeded. They were able to get the correct amount of people into the Senate who would support suffrage the war ended, and then in January of 1920, the Senate voted to pass. So they were looking out from 1920 at a world where women had the vote. Alice Paul said, just getting the vote is not, not the end of all things. It's, it's how to use it. How are we going to use the vote that will make a difference? The 19th Amendment also didn't give the vote to every woman. Native Americans were not even considered citizens until 1924 with the Indian Citizenship Act. Asian women got the vote in 1948, but uh, Jim Crow and, and um, discrimination in the South kept black men and women from voting. It wasn't until 1964, the Civil Rights Act, and 1965 with the Voter Rights Act that it was legally uh, not okay to discriminate at the polls. And we're still navigating a lot of that. If you pay attention, we've got election year coming up. So, so a lot of this history um, is very present today with different circumstances, but we're still working on what does equality mean in our society? At this point, I will ask, does anybody have any questions about the story, um, any comments? I would love to have you uh, share those. And you can just unmute yourself or you can type it in the chat, either way. While you're, um, while you're doing that, I gave this program once live with PowerPoint and everything. And, and after I, um, we had a hundred people at, in the room, it was great. And afterwards, a woman came up to me. She was probably late 60s, early 70s. And she said, I didn't want to share this when we were sharing. But I wanted to tell you, when I was growing up and coming of age in the 1960s, my grandmother, who came of age in the teens and saw that amendment come to fruition, um, was, was part of... A, a family that didn't really think women should have education or, or um, that this voting thing was kind of silly. And she said, when I was 
going to college and getting my education in the 1960s, my grandmother came to me and she said, you're so lucky to be living now. And I understand the changes that you're trying to see happen because I lived that myself the first time around. And she felt a really special bond with her grandmother going forward from there because they'd shared a very similar experience. It looks like Donna has a question and she's unmuted. Yes. Just briefly, most of the women you mentioned I've heard of, but do you have anything briefly to add on Louise Paul? That name was new to me. Uh, so Alice Paul. Um, <clears throat> Alice Paul. Yes, Alice Paul was a young woman. She was, um, she was in England working with the suffragists there. And she really was the, she went to, she was one of the ones that was picketing the White House. She went to prison repeatedly. Every time those suffragists were let out of prison in 19, 16, 17, they went right back to the picket lines. They were not going to give up. They persisted and Alice actually lived a long life. She lived into the 1970s. In 1923, Alice Paul suggested the first version of the Equal Rights Amendment because she said without a federal equal rights amendment, women will have no opportunity to defend themselves in federal courts. Uh, these other laws came in and they were layered, but we needed a federal amendment for equal rights. And, uh, it wasn't until 1972 that the Equal Rights Amendment passed both houses of Congress, and it has yet to be ratified. Many state constitutions still have those, still have, or, or do include those rights, but we don't have a federal amendment yet. And Alice uh, just barely lived to see it finally pass both houses of Congress. Alice Paul. That was really interesting. My, um, it's kind of a question, uh, kind of an observation. Mm -hmm. I noticed with some of my students, I teach, I'm a history professor at Carroll College, and I noticed with some of my students to, you know, to channel Susan Faludi, I see a certain backlash, right? With feminism for some of them has become an epithet. And yeah. I have some students for who it's almost like you should be ashamed. And Randy's nodding, right? And um, I, I, I guess I wonder how, I guess I look at a lot of these women and I, I've lived in parts of the world where women were just getting the vote and I, I sort of saw what they went through. So that then when our students don't want that and they don't, and especially our young women that don't want to kind of push the cause of, of equal rights, I just wonder what you see as the constraints of today that are, might be on them. So if it was clothing in the last century or so, mm. what is it, to, I mean, what do you think it is today? Okay, so maybe it's my age speaking, and please, this is not an answer, more of just a comment, and everyone here has the same, I, you know, please step in. Um, I think the media keeps telling young people what they should be doing or what they should be wearing or how they should be acting or what language they should be using, what is cool, what is going to make them interesting to their circles. And as a person who's been through a number more decades looking, looking at that, I think, well, where's their authenticity? What's going to cause them to step into this place, their causes seem to be virtual and their behavior seems to be virtual. That's an observation. Please, someone chime in. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I think media is putting a lot of pressure on what's, what normal is that isn't normal, it's virtual. And, and when will they come to that place of knowing there's a difference? Someone else, Randy? You're I think, yeah, I think that I think the the students don't always know the history, and I think that's why conversations and programs like this are important, so that they know the history and the. I mean, just listening to your presentation, Seneca Falls, what eighteen thirty four and forty eight. Forty eight. Okay, 
And then the the right to the 19th Amendment, 1919, 1920, I mean, so much, I don't think they have a sense of like how long that fight, that, that arc right. what, was. So, and I've certainly, Jeanette, I've had students come back years later and say, oh, now I get it. And, it, and part of it was going into the working world as a woman and um, starting to understand some of those, those things. So, and I think some of the, um, Kim mentioned Mrs. America on, it's on Hulu, I think, about the, about the ERA and the, um, or the um, 20th century women's movement. I haven't been able to watch it yet, but I think just reminders like that to younger women that, um, that that's the history. I think that that might be important. And Kim also, or someone mentioned the Me Too movement. I think that young women are starting to rally around that. And if, if video is a good way to reach them, Iron Jawed Angels is an outstanding yes. film about the end of the, the 18, I mean, 1919, 1920, that end, put them in jail, just, and never give up history. So Iron Jawed Angels is a good reference for them if they'll watch it. It's five o'clock. I just was hoping, Mary Jane, there are some comments in the chat that I, I just as to maybe wrap up if you could address. Sure, sure. The Equal Rights Amendment and the current status of that. Where is that? Do you know? You know, I think when you set something out to be ratified, it has only a certain number of years before Congress has to either, you know, make it go away or re-up the um, time in which it can be ratified. The last I knew is that it had run out of its, its ratification um, limit, time limit. And if they wanna get it out there again, they have to start over. That's what I think is the case. I think you only have seven or seven years maybe to ratify something. And after that, you can get an extension, but I think the extensions are all over now. It might be not Do you on know the how table. many times it has been attempted? The ratification has been attempted? Well, it was passed by, and this we can Google, I might be off on my years, but um, 1972 is when it was passed. So if it had seven years, it's probably had um, several extensions. That I really don't know. We could look that up. It received at least uh, one additional extension. And my, I, I think I'm correct that just in the last few months, the last state that was needed to ratify, Virginia ratified it, but because they were even past the extended deadline. And now there's a bill that's working its way through the House. Ann Holub, I think you mentioned this, that um, is, is looking to posthumously kind of extend the deadline again. Yes, I, I actually just wrapped up. This is America on Hulu and Randy. Oh my God, you have to watch it. It's amazing. They just posted the last episode. It's it's been a weekly rollout. Um, and in the epilogue, they mentioned that um, yes, it was I think Nevada or maybe Arizona and then Illinois and then Virginia just last year ratified. Um, and the House does apparently have some legislation that they would like to you know um, be able to take that ratification and put it into law, but. Um, the Senate apparently has said, you know, because it's a Republican controlled Senate, the Senate has no interest in moving forward with that legislation should they get it. So it's stuck again. Um, so that's another, you know, thing to so, maybe push for. <laughs> well, Mary Jane, this was so wonderful. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, I don't want to keep anyone too late on a Friday afternoon, but please join us again next week. We have Dennis Swibold, who will, um, his topic is what happened to the news? And he will talk about um, going to the source to find your news uh, and navigating the, he calls it an infodemic uh, in these times. So please join us again. Um, thank you so much for being here and we'll see yes. you next. Yes, thank you all for being here.